Okay, we, we have a very interesting half an hour in front of us uh, to discuss how pharma can capitalize on Asia for growth and innovation. Now, uh, with the slight slowdown in the industry and also with uh, the lack of uh, drugs candidates in existing pipelines, more and more multinational companies are looking to embed within uh, innovation-oriented R&D um, environments rather than service and manufacturing intensive economies. And this is really a way of managing cost and also the uncertainties that the future may present. And this is also where Asia fits into, it, into the equation. Uh, and a lot of multinational companies are looking to Asia to manage this risk and uh, for this particular purpose. Um, so if I may start the discussion by asking Anders the first question. Now AstraZeneca has made significant investment in Asia. Uh, and I think the recent uh, Hutchison Medifarma deal is a very good example of that. So how can, uh, can you share with us uh, how Asia fits into AstraZeneca's global strategy and what are the incentives for partnering with uh, Asian companies? Uh, thank you very much and, and good morning. Um, you mentioned um, you know, a specific deal. I think if you take a step back uh, first and look on why do we want partnership in the first place, we announced a strategic change in 2010 that we're following through and we said that we wanted about 40% of our pipeline to be in licensed from different partners. And this still means that we're going to do a lot ourselves, but we're going to have sort of a very large proportion coming from the outside. And, and if you say that, then of course you have to say where can you find those opportunities? And, and Asia seems to be a good place to be. Um, if you look into where, where the medical need is large, where you see a lot of growth, it's obviously in Asia. You just have to look outside this hotel and you realize there's a lot of things happening in Asia. And if you look into China uh, and India and Korea and Japan, where we all have significant footprint, science is driving forward. And, and basically what we look for is excellent science or science excellence, um, because that's what's going to drive innovation. And what is really rewarding to me is to see that there's a lot of expats coming back from US and, and other places into China. The, the science quality is going up. Uh, we're still waiting for the breakthroughs in, in a larger content, but you know, referring to the chairman around scouting, China is obviously a place to go. Having said that, we have a lot of activities in India as well and, and into Korea and Japan. So I, I think from a general perspective, Asia is interesting and it fits our footprint and we may come back to that later on. So we have heard from a multinational company how um, they see Asia. So maybe we can turn to a local company, and Kieran. Um, Biocon has been very successful in, in its international collaboration. So how uh, do you see the, your partnering model, and what is the partnering model that you think uh, work best for Asia? Um, you know, um we have basically uh, pursued uh, partnering as a strong business strategy uh, to really sort of uh, look at global opportunities in many, many ways. And I think the reverse is true. I think Anders just mentioned that Asia today is becoming hotly sought after, largely because of the fact that Asia is a very large growth market opportunity. But apart from that, I think it's really about changing the innovation model per se. Uh, at Biocon, basically, we feel that there are three or four types of partnering models. And we have basically got examples in every one of them. I think the foremost uh, reason for partnering both from an Asian company's perspective and a global company's perspective, to me, is really about risk and resource sharing. Because I really believe that uh, sharing resources in, in low-cost economies in Asia with uh, the innovative po quotient of what's happening in Western companies is a very, very important of, uh, part of taking innovation to the market in a very cost-effective way. And we have many, many examples of this. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we've been uh, partnering with uh, a very innovative uh, company in San Diego called Amelin, uh, developing a a diabetes drug and I think that's been a very very good example of how the two companies are sharing resources and risk and I think if we make it to the market it will be a very affordable way of innovating and bringing products to the market. 
Uh, the other uh, aspect of partnering which we have found very effective is that I think Asia and Asian companies is a very cost-effective development partner. And you know that there are many, many small biotech companies in uh, the US, in Europe, um, who are virtual companies. And they need development capabilities, which they normally kind of access either from uh, Western uh, companies or now from Asian companies. And I think Asian companies are allowing them a very cost-effective way of utilizing their resources in a much better way. It's doing more for less, basically. So, you know, using Asian companies as a development partner is proving to be a very, very effective model. We have a very outstanding example of that. Uh, we, ha we partnered with a small San Diego company called Optima Pharma. We did all their basic, uh, you know, development for them, supported them all the way through clinical development, and they just got US FDA approval and the NEMIA approval a little later. And I can tell you it was done very cost effectively. And the company themselves have tell us that, you know, it wouldn't have been possible for them to really commercialize this and take it to the market so fast if it wasn't for the support they got from, from a company like ours. So I think these are opportunities. And of course, the third is, of course, the whole research services opportunity, where a number of, uh, you know, companies are really leveraging the uh, Asian talent base and the cost base to really deliver high value innovation. So I think this is not, this is about cost and skills and combining these two and then marrying it with a lot of the innovativeness that's coming out of uh, companies in many parts of the world. And last but not least, of course, there's a lot of innovation as well going on in Asia. And these are then about partnering with uh, you know, Western big pharma and seeing whether they can help them take these to the market. So I think partnering to me uh, is a very important way forward for all companies because you just heard the chairman say that 65% of their programs or products have, have come from in licensing. So I think these are very important trends and I think companies are definitely realizing that having totally verti vertically integrated models are not going to be cost effective and not going to be able to allow them to deliver affordable innovation, which is really the need of the art today. Yeah, you, uh, you mentioned, I mean, uh, commercial, commercializing biotech um, products is an extra, extraordinary complex process. Uh, and uh, some companies have found it quite difficult to actually narrow the technology gap to, between science and industry. But uh, I think uh, BGI has been very successful in overcoming this obstacle. Uh, and so, Dr. Wang, can you share with us how BGI has been able to narrow the gap, I mean, and, and convert science into, a, an, a, into, in, into industrial application? Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, forgive me the opportunity to explain uh, what's going on in BGI and uh, so how we connected the, 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 the research, basically research to the uh, clinical applications. So we are, uh, the BGI started with a human genome project. We were a part of a human genome project. We think in the future that the personalized medicine, the personal genome will be the most important part. That is, the personal genetic information will play a big role for the uh, health care. So for the future, prevention and uh, prediction will be the future. So we started with the Human Genome Project. Looks like uh, it's the basic research so we got lots of good publication. And then we, when we turned this information to the uh, clinic applications, we found a lot of opportunity, especially in Asia countries. Uh, most of them, they're developing countries, including China. And the birds defect, all this genetic disease, still is a big problem. 
And uh, infection disease also is a big problem. For those kind of things, prevention is the most Im important thing. And the, the sequencing and the genome data can provide the, the basic information to be the uh, very important part for the disease control. So, what, right now what we are doing is to use the basic information directly go to the uh, clinical applications. <clears throat> for example, when we do the, the HPV testing, the sequencing, for the for the uh, women's uh, what's the called name that the, the disease what's the tumor disease yeah cervical cancer it's a, we can bring the cost ten times lower and give the data if they get the positive uh, result they go to the uh, doctors so we can this is a big uh, advance. And also for the Down syndrome, uh, this kind of prenatal non-invasion diagnosis. Also, it's the, it's a, basically it's the information business. So, for the traditional medicine, traditional uh, diagnosis, they cannot go that far. They don't have the computer. They don't have this uh, quick uh, sequence power. So when we link these thing, two things together, there's big demand there, and people need it. So in other words, there's a big market there. So since last year, we got a license for the uh, clinical applications. Our uh, revenue uh, keep the glowing in 20% per month, almost more than 10 months. So just still like this. So be the good guy and <laughs> doing the good thing and put a lot of money and effort to the basic research and get the basic knowledge and translate to the clinical applications. So, for another example, uh, two, two weeks ago, we got a two paper published in Cell. And for the last 30 months, we have a Nature and Science publications every month. And our uh, market share, uh, basically, we have no competitors right now in China, in East Asia because nobody ran right now into this kind of business. So it's very easy for us to penetrate the market. The, the most difficult thing is convince our government to give us a license because nobody have done this in the world. We are the pioneer, we are the first one. So spend, we need to spend more time to convince them so this is how was PGI going. Also, we have lots of partners with the big farmers. And for the, last, for the first 20 big farmers, there are 17 companies partner with us, including your companies in the States, not, not in the uh, Gosenberg. <laughs> I think uh, it would be now be a good opportunity for the audience maybe to uh, ask questions to this very distinguished panel. Um, does anyone want to start with a question? Okay, maybe then I have another question. Uh, so, uh, there are a lot, I mean, a lot of opportunities in Asia, uh, but um, what would you say the challenges are? And what would you uh, look for when you choose where to invest and where to actually um, uh, uh, partner with local companies? Maybe Andres, can, can you? 
I, I think it, it depends on what you want to achieve. Um, so representing a large pharma uh, will, with a multinational sort of approach, it goes everything from uh, we have, uh, you know, to exemplify it, a couple of examples. Uh, we have a, a, a treatment for uh, non-small cell lung cancer called ERESA, which is going for a specific mutation in GFR, uh, you know, uh, mutations. And we need a diagnostic. And in order to uh, penetrate the market in China, uh, we have an agreement with a diagnostic company. And that means we partner with a small company. We educate physicians and, and healthcare providers, and that would be one example where you're basically looking for someone who can take your diagnostic into a large country like China. In the other side of the spectrum, it would be something like um, you know data management or patient uh, safety case handling, where we have agreements with two Indian companies, Cognizant and, and Tata Consulting, which then provide basically a, a business process outsourcing. You know, and then you mentioned. Hutchinson Medipharma, which is perhaps unique and we should spend two minutes on, where basically I think for the first time uh, multinational agrees with a Chinese company who have a, a compound, a, a CMET kinase inhibitor, which they have taken up into starting phase one. And, and uh, I know we have a representative for the company here in, in, in the audience, where basically we start phase one and Hutchinson will run phase one in China together with us, take the lead, we will take the lead outside China. So that could represent a nice opportunity for a Chinese company to take the step out into the global world. And why do you partner with all these kinds of companies? Well, you're looking for excellence in whatever area you're looking for. I think it's that simple. And then you have to say, what do we want? And in this case, there was a nice fit on, we want to expand into this cancer segment. They have a compound we can partner and agree. So I think, uh, let's keep it simple. And then you look for various different things, as, as Kiran said as well. Kiran, um, in your experience with uh, international companies, in international uh, collaboration, can you share with us your experience in, um, in, in, in building up your reputation in international collaboration and what you have seen to be the challenges? You know, if you look at it, I think one of the biggest uh, perception challenges that Asian companies have to overcome is IP. And I think if you can get over that IP perception hurdle, then the partnership becomes very strong. I think we as a company have uh, very strong partnerships because I think we have demonstrated a very strong IP uh, orientation, you know, respect for IP, and of course we create a lot of IP, so I think that sort of uh, creates very strong partnerships. So I think that to me is really one of the biggest challenges that most companies have when they look for partnerships in Asia. Because I think Asian companies uh, do have a challenge of overcoming that perception, and especially because uh, com most companies in India and many in China are generics companies. And I think most recently there was this controversial ruling of compulsory licensing in India, which makes it even tougher uh, to battle this perception. I know that the biotech sector in, in India came strongly against this compulsory licensing, but it was completely you know, supported by the generics industry. So you constantly have these issues where, uh, uh, you know, Asian companies have to get over this, uh, this perception by demonstrating very strong IP kind of orientation. And to me, the moment companies are able to demonstrate that, I think you can enter into very strong partnerships. You, you mentioned that uh, it's very important for the companies themselves to show that they respect IP. Yeah, and also more than respecting IP, I think Asian companies are very capable of being very innovative. Mm. But I think the ecosystem here does not really support, uh, you know, innovative business models. They are so used to the sort of generics, imitative business models that they rather invest in those, you know, safe bets and sure shot kind of businesses rather than take the risk of innovation. Mm. And I think that's what uh, Asia needs to really create, is this ecosystem that supports innovation. Because I really believe that Asia is the place where you can really pursue 
innovation in a very affordable manner and we should take full advantage of that. To me, that really is the opportunity that companies like us are very, very focused on. Mm. We have a very interesting pipeline of novel products and I know that we are beginning to garner a lot of interest in, in partnering with us and we want to, as a company of our size, at least take it into the clinic, into a, into a, a, a sort of a, almost de-risked asset so that it can unlock higher value for us and it can actually increase the probability of commercial success for the partner. Could I just follow up on that? I think when we talk about the ecosystem, I, I think it's, it's also different for different companies depending on what sort of part of the ecosystem you have yourself in Asia. So if I look upon it, just taking one example from an AstraZeneca perspective, I mean in 2006 we started and an building an innovation center in Shanghai and started with translational research within the oncology field and we're now expanding it to a unit being able to deliver proof of concepts basically up into phase two. And that, of course, gives us a platform to interact with Chinese companies and others because we have people on the ground. So that, I think that's a good facilitator for large companies when you have that ability. We have sort of a, a unit in Bangalore as well, making it easier to make an inroad into India, for example. So I think it puts different companies into different perspective. But, but to me, the guiding star is, is why do we build these units? Well, we built it in China, not for cost. We built it because we want to get hold of innovation. So you have to be clear on what you're trying to achieve as well. That's very good. But Dr. Wai, I mean, oh, I have a question. This is Sumera from Dr. Reddy Laboratories in India. Uh, as the panel has described, the partners have evolved to fill the gap in their pipelines and move to Asia to look at licensing. We, we cannot hear you very clearly. Okay, this is Sumera from Dr. Reddy's. Is it better? Okay. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, in the beginning when the partnerships were looked at in Asia, it was primarily to fill the gap in the pipeline. But as Kiran has alluded, that the business model has evolved towards risk and resource sharing, leveraging the cost advantage the Asian, Asian companies offer. Now with the big multinational companies either getting into their long-term partnerships or having their own shops in the Asian countries, what's your vision for future towards filling the gap in the pipelines. Are we going to look beyond the cost advantage or are we going to stick to the business models of cost, cost advantage? Okay. I think I kind of half deciphered what you said. Uh, I think the question you were asking was what is the kind of model going forward? Is it going to be about outsourcing for cost advantage or is it about, you know, taking advantage of innovation in, in, in Asia. Right. I think Anders already referred to it. I think if people only want to you know, leverage the cost advantage in, in China, it's a very limited benefit. At least I'm sure Anders will, and I'm sure Jin Yang will, uh, will, will ag uh, agree with me, that it's a very limited uh, opportunity. It's really about uh, leveraging the today's cost base which tomorrow might change, but really to leverage a cost base to deliver high value. So that's about innovation. It has to be about innovation. It has to be about long-term partnerships. At least that's my view. I mean, what I would like to add to, and, and if we look a bit sort of like we don't get the question, is because all the loudspeakers are going in that direction. So it's very hard, sort of difficult to hear your question. Um, so thanks, Karen, for that. Now, I think sort of uh, from a large company perspective, you, you look for different things. And of course, if you go for innovation, it's not going to be about you know, cost control. But I think if I look upon our needs, we would look for innovation, like I explained with Innovation Center in China. We're still looking for large patient volumes, of course, in certain diseases. But as soon as you move into, for example, personalized healthcare, and you're looking for you know, using genome sequencing, et cetera, you want to go where you have a sort of advanced healthcare that can provide you with that sort of infrastructure enabling you to take that step. So I think the biology here will dictate what you need to deliver to be an attractive partner. Dr. Wang, do you want to add anything? No, I, I, I totally agree with that. So. I, I think we have reached um, uh, the end of our discussion here. Uh, I, I would really like to thank our panelists. No, I think this is not.
the right clock. <laughs> so, so thank you so much uh, for your insights and your views. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure that uh, our panelists can uh, answer them uh, outside of this session.